In 1801, a famous physicist was the governor of the French province of Isère. His name was Joseph Fourier. On a routine inspection of the schools in his province, Fourier discovered an exceptional 11-year-old boy, Jean-Francois Champollion. The boy's precocious intellect and remarkable flair for languages had already earned him the admiring attention of local scholars. Fourier, too, was impressed. What Champollion first saw in Fourier's house determined the course of his life and unlocked the secrets of an alien civilization. Fourier had recently participated as one of many scientists in Napoleon's expedition to the Middle East. He had been in charge of cataloging the astronomical monuments of Egypt. The boy was entranced by Fourier's collection of ancient Egyptian artifacts, the mysterious fragments of a lost world. France at this time was flooded with such artifacts, plundered by Napoleon, and now arousing intense interest among scholars and the general public. The boy's attention was caught by a specimen of Egyptian hieroglyphics. What do they mean, he asked. Nobody knows, was Fourier's reply. Then and there, Champollion resolved that he would understand this language that no one could read, that he would decode the messages from another world and another time. He became a superb linguist and immersed himself in the hieroglyphics. Fourier edited the illustrated description of Napoleon's expedition. The young Champollion studied it hungrily. To the people of Europe, these exotic images revealed an utterly alien civilization, a world of towering monuments and magical names. Dendera, Karnak, Luxor. Every illustration was a riddle posed by the past to the present. And among them were pictures of something called the Rosetta Stone. And portraits of the people who lived among the ruins of the pharaohs. Egypt became the land of Champollion's dreams. But it was not until 1828, 27 years after his fateful visit with Fourier, that Champollion first set foot in Egypt. With his companions, Champollion chartered boats in Cairo and sailed slowly upstream, following the course of the Nile. It was a journey of many weeks, which Champollion recorded in extraordinary detail. This was an expedition through time, a voyage across the centuries to another world. Champollion, as an adult, had already worked out a brilliant decipherment of the hieroglyphics, a word, incidentally, that means sacred carvings. Now Champollion was making a pilgrimage 
to the scene of the ancient mysteries he had been the first to understand. Champollion wrote, the evening of the 16th, we finally arrived at Dendera. We were only an hour away from the temples. Could we resist the temptation? I ask the coldest of you mortals. to dine and leave immediately were the orders of the moment. Alone and without guides, we crossed the fields. Presuming that the temples were in a straight line from our boat, we walked thus for an hour and a half without finding anything. We finally discovered a man who put us on the correct route and ended up walking with us with good graces. The temple appeared to us at last. I shall not try to describe the impression which the porches and above all the portico made on us. We stayed there two hours in ecstasy, running through the huge rooms and trying to read the exterior inscriptions in the moonlight. It was with no small rapture that Champollion entered the secret places of the temple and scanned the words that had waited patiently through half a million nights for a reader. To his brother, Champollion wrote of his joy in confirming that he could understand the writing on these walls. I am now proud, he said, that having followed the course of the Nile to the second cataract, I have the right to announce that there is nothing to modify in our letter on the alphabet of hieroglyphics. Our alphabet is good. It is applicable with the same success, first of all, in Egyptian monuments of the epoch of the Romans, and also, which is more interesting, to the inscriptions on all temples, palaces, and tombs of the Pharaonic epoch. Champollion was overwhelmed by the grandeur which surrounded him. It is the union, he said, of grace and majesty in the highest degree. We in Europe are only dwarfs. No nation, ancient or modern, has conceived the art of architecture on such a sublime, great and imposing style as the ancient Egyptians. They ordered everything to be done for people who are a hundred feet high. <laughs> 